morning. Have you ever missed a turn on the freeway? You know how that is where you're, you're driving along and you just kind of start following the car in front of you? And then suddenly you see that road veering off to the side. And you're like, ah, I should have been in the other lane. You know, and it's, and it's even worse if you don't notice the road, right? Or then you're just driving along and, you, and all of a sudden you're like miles down the road and you realize somehow I have to get back there. I mean, you can just keep driving and it can be terrible. That happened to us one time going into Chicago. It was, I mean, we were like an hour trying to find our way back. Now, I think something similar can happen to us as believers as we try to navigate moral issues, particularly in regard to our subject today, we're talking about gender and sexuality. Because there's some people that we know, they're just, they're just clearly going away from biblical teaching, right? It's like the other side of the freeway. It's, it's obvious that they're not headed in the same direction. But then there are others who just seem to be in the next lane over. And they seem to be going our way. I mean, they hold, you know, we might call it traditional views or conservative views, and yet they're not committed to following Jesus or obeying his word. So if we're not careful, what can happen is we might find ourselves getting into their lane and failing to notice when the way of Christ diverges from their path. Now, that may explain at least one reason why we have such a difficult time speaking the truth in love. Because I think what happens is we assume that the people going the opposite direction are the greatest threat to us and our children and our society. And quite honestly, in some senses, speaking the truth in love, that seems too passive of, of a response. It seems too slow. And so we're tempted to, to shift over to the other lane, even though it might exude disgust, condescension, anger, even hatred, all these things that are not Christ-like. And what can happen is that our own self-righteousness can blind us from seeing how far we've left the way of Christ. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 14 to 15, Paul says that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. He says that his servants present themselves as servants of righteousness, right? Maybe even as apostles, that was happening in Paul's day. And so all that to say the most dangerous threat to the cause of Christ is, is probably not those who are obviously wrong. We see the error there. But it's those who appear to be on our side, who seem to be heading our way, because their influence has the most potential to, to skew our understanding and then to end up distorting our character and to damage our witness without us even realizing. So be careful. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful who you promote online. Don't just share a quote from somebody just because it sounds right. I mean, the most influential voices in our lives should be, this is a, the whole point of, of how the church is supposed to work in the Bible, the most influential people should be people that you know personally. People that you know are humble, are teachable, who know the scripture well, who are growing in Christ's likeness, who are seeking to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. And then the other part of that is you need to know God's word for yourself. And that's what this series is all about, right? That, that we would exercise discernment, applying the word of God to the, the, the issues of life. And so as we come to this issue of gender and sexuality, to speak the truth and love about it, let me suggest four biblical landmarks to guide our way. And the first landmark, as I'm calling it, is simply this. It's that 
God designed gender and sexuality. Back when I was in elementary school, you, you know, my teachers just loved doing art projects, and particularly, like, with clay. And, you know, I mean, those were the sorts of things that only a mother could love, because they were not pretty, right? And they were not useful, and of course, no one expected them to be. I mean, we, we, none of us had the skill or the creativity of some master potter or craftsman. We were just playing around and learning. And if we made something ugly, no one really cared because you could throw it out and start over. But you know, the crazy thing is, some people think that we should approach gender and sexuality like one of those elementary school art projects. They argue that from childhood... People should just have the freedom to shape their lives however they want. Now, we don't do that with other aspects of life, right? We don't throw kids the car keys in elementary school and say, hey, go figure out how to drive and, you know, do it however feels right to you. I mean, there's far too much at stake to do that. And so that's why that we have to say the first landmark to guide our thinking about gender and sexuality is that God's our creator. He's the potter. We're the clay. And he has a wise and perfect design. And it's revealed to us in the first two chapters of the book of Genesis. Genesis, we talked about Genesis 1.26 last time. Genesis 1.27 tells us this. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female he created them so since we're created in the image of god that gives us dignity and worth we're set apart from all the other creatures god designed us as as human beings to reflect what he's like and to accomplish that he made two genders male and female and you might think, well, of course he did. It was a biological necessity. But, I mean, he's God, you know? I mean, he could have formed some other plan for reproduction. I don't know. And yet, he chose to create a man and a woman. That's how God did it. And so verse 28 continues and, and tells us God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, skipping down, the second chapter of Genesis provides more details, I think, about what happened on that sixth day of creation. In fact, some New Testament passages, Ephesians 5, 1 Timothy 2, they draw upon this chapter, Genesis 2, to explain God's design for gender roles and marriage and even in the church. And so, jumping down, Genesis 2, verses 7 and 8, they tell us this. It says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And so there's this key point here, simple idea, that the man was created first. And so God gives him responsibility. Responsibility for this garden. He was to work it, he was to keep it, he could, he could eat from what it produced, except for the, the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil, he couldn't eat for that. And so part of what is, is being set up here is that later he would need to take the lead in keeping that prohibition, obeying the Lord, and in communicating God's command to his wife. And so that's a key idea. Biblical manhood is all about responsibility. Now God also charges the man with naming all the animals. And the whole point of it is to show him that none of them are like him. We skip down to verses 20 through 25, and it says, The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, 
there was not found a helper fit for him. And so it says, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And it tells us, then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And it says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And so their gender differences were not just a matter of reproduction. They were designed to complement one another. A responsible leader, supportive helper, and yet also the deepest of companions. And uh, their sexual union really represents the nature of their relationship. The Lord describes it there as being one flesh, right? Joined together, two lives, uh, joined permanently without any shame, fear, guilt, or regret to get in the way. So we have to see that's God's good and perfect design for gender, for sexuality, for marriage, but that leads us to a second biblical landmark. Of course, it's, it's the fall, the first sin. The fall distorts our desires. You know how it is when you drop a piece of pottery, it doesn't just break, it, it shatters. And you know, the pieces scatter everywhere. And you might not even be able to to see what its original design was from the pieces. But when Adam and Eve fell into sin, their lives were shattered. And they pass on that brokenness to all of us as their descendants. I mean, you see it even just physically in our bodies. God created them to live forever. And we all became subject to aging, to sickness, to death. And in the fall, it... it, it Influence it hinders our minds. It prevents us from understanding spiritual truth. And most importantly for our consideration of gender and sexuality, it, it distorts our desires. And I think that distortion becomes immediately apparent after Adam and Eve eat from the forbidden tree. We just read at the end of chapter 2 that prior to the fall, they were naked and not ashamed. And then they eat of the tree skipping down to Genesis 3, and in verse 7 tells us, then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Now, no one else was around. Right? It's just Adam and Eve. And yet suddenly they're uncomfortable with their physical differences. <laughs> Why did they feel the impulse to cover up? What changed? They feel attraction, repulsion, fear, shame. I mean, clearly their relationship had changed. And there's now this divide, this separation between them. And that, that distortion then reverberates throughout history. God's design is for sex to be part of an exclusive, one-flesh, lifelong marriage relationship between a man and a woman. But since the fall, no one really seems to be satisfied with that. Right? They want either something more or something less than that or something entirely different than that. It all gets twisted around. And so you get to Genesis 4, just the very next chapter, verse 19 of chapter 4, tells us that one of Adam and Eve's descendants through their son Cain, a man named Lamech, takes two wives. But that's a violation of God's design. You keep reading, you get later on in Genesis, and there's, we hear of concubines and prostitutes, and you read of the violent homosexual behavior in Sodom and Gomorrah. By the time Moses reveals God's law, the seventh commandment, of course, we know prohibits adultery. But then you get into the nitty-gritty of Leviticus 18, and it records prohibition of sex between 
relatives, between unmarried people, between people of the same gender, between people and animals. I mean, you hear of things going on in our culture, and a lot of people act shocked like it's this new <laughs> corruption in society. It's been around for thousands of years. Right? Moses addressed it. Don't be surprised. Now, in other people, they say because they experience these desires that they must therefore be natural and good. But again, it's, it's a result of the fall. In Romans 1, 24 through 27, Paul explains that our desires are distorted in part as an expression of God's wrath against sin. Romans 1, 24 begins and says, therefore God gave them up, I think this is talking about all of humanity, gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And then it continues, verse this is 26 and 27. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. See, when Adam and Eve ate from the tree, they chose to serve themselves rather than the Creator, just like. Paul's talking about there in Romans 1. And so that then trickles down to all of us as their descendants. We're all driven by that same selfishness. And as a result, our hearts have been given over to impure desires. Now that doesn't mean that those desires all head in the same direction. Right? And, and as Paul describes it here, homosexuality is farther away from God's design. But all sexual sin offends God. We're all lost and broken. And the effects of the fall also extend just beyond sexual desire to even our experience of gender. So you continue down in Genesis 3, the Lord pronounces his curse uh, upon the serpent and upon uh, Adam and Eve, and then verse uh, Genesis 3, 16 tells us to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. I mean, it's hard to know, was there some change in the woman's anatomy here? We don't know, but obviously the fear of this, of pain, would certainly not help her sexual relationship or her feelings about being a woman. And the fall would lead to this conflict between male and female with her husband. I mean, earlier on in Genesis 1, the word rule is used positively, but that's over animals and creatures. Here, it seems to have a negative connotation. And certainly, we see the results of that in society, right? I mean, even in the Bible itself. Judges chapter 5, for instance, tells us how the Lord raised up Deborah to serve as the judge over Israel because really no man was willing to lead. Or on the other hand, men can be domineering and harsh like the Persian king Ahasuerus in the book of Esther. Right? Who wants to, who ends up banishing his wife Vashti because she, she won't come out and show off her beauty, whatever that meant in that culture, <laughs> to his group of drunken men. Now, to complicate matters, every culture develops its own stereotypes of what it means to be male and female. Right? And, and, and those ideas vary from time to time and place to place. People identify certain clothing or interests or activities um, as either male or female. And, and what do they do? Then they, they kind of look down upon or scorn those who don't conform to that. It's a cultural thing. Now, some of those distinctions might align with God's design 
responsible men, supportive women. But a lot of those things don't. I mean, some of them are just neutral, whatever, take it or leave it. But others contradict God's design. And so again, we see a lot of cultures through history that have really legitimized domineering men and have treated women as little more than slaves. That's not the way the Lord wants someone created in the image of God to be treated. And then there are cultures like our own in recent decades that kind of goad women into dressing and behaving in seductive ways. And so all that to say, we have to remember that culture, whether it be liberal or conservative, culture is not a reliable authority in defining gender. It, it could, because it just reflects those distorted desires from the fall. And so we have to recognize that, and we should even refute uh, those false ideas about masculinity and femininity. But some people, some people go too far with that. Right? They, they want to rebel against it by changing their gender identity. And the medical procedures for, for doing that sort of thing may be new, but, but the desire behind it, it's not. It goes back to the fall. Even back in Deuteronomy 22.5, God uh, addresses that desire somewhat in his, his law. It says, a woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak, for whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. Now, you know what's funny about that is I doubt that any of us would be able to tell the difference between a 3,400-year-old man's garment and, and a woman's cloak. We, we wouldn't know the difference, right? It's, it was a cultural standard of that place and time. And, and we find something similar even in the New Testament. First Corinthians 11, Paul argues that women should wear head coverings, right? Again, because that was a cultural thing at the time. And so the issue, I think we have to say, is not the clothing per se, but the person's desire to escape their God-given gender. I think that's just one more example of how the fall has distorted our desires. So what hope is there? Well, we find it in the next landmark. It's, it's just this, that Jesus saves sinners. There's a Japanese art form called kintsugi. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but uh, it works with broken pottery. And the, the shattered pieces are not just simply glued together. The cracks are filled with gold. And so the beauty and value comes from the repairs. That's what Jesus does for, with us. Every broken person who comes to him. And we're, we're all shattered by the fall. And he takes, takes those pieces and he cleans them off and puts us back together to display the beauty of God's saving grace. It, it doesn't matter how distorted our desires have been and led us away from God's design, even with gender and sexuality. Jesus saves sinners. Paul emphasized that truth to the Corinthians. Now, first century Corinth was, uh, it had a reputation for sexual immorality in the city. I mean, it was a, it was a major seaport, in, and it's kind of like all major seaports. It caters to vice. But there were also uh, a lot of temples that included cultic prostitution in their worship of the Greco-Roman deities. And so as Paul writes to Christians in Corinth, he really takes, makes an effort to be clear of, first, both the sinfulness of sexual immorality, but at the same time, the power of salvation. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. Paul says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, 
nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And I love verse 11. He says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. We have to remember the consequences are the same for every sin. Adulterer or homosexual, thief, drunkard, reviler, which just means hating people, right? Our sins disqualify us from eternal life in Christ's kingdom. Whatever those sins are, they all deserve eternal punishment. And yet, whatever your besetting sin may be. You can be saved through faith in Christ. And, and there were people from all of those backgrounds there in the church in Corinth, just as there are in every church. And we're all sinners saved by grace. And so Paul describes salvation here in, in three ways. First, salvation is, is washing, he calls it. This is really one of the only places, there's only one other place in Scripture where that term is used. Other times we talk about cleansing. Through his death on the cross, Jesus provided the cleansing we need from the stain of sin. Second, salvation is sanctification. Right? When, when we come into connection with Christ, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, it makes us holy. Now, previously, we talked about sanctification as the process of growth in obedience. Sometimes theologians call it progressive sanctification. But here, Paul seems to have in mind just our standing before God. When we believe, we're set apart to God. Instantaneously holy. When we believe, it brings about that transformation. And then that leads third, salvation is also justification. In other words, we're, we're clothed in the perfect obedience of Christ so that God declares us to be righteous, even though we're not. And so as we relate to the unbelieving people in our world, we have to remember they're all sinners in need of salvation, just like you and just like me. And it doesn't really matter what their sins are. There's no point in trying to get people to change apart from the saving work of Christ. That's futile. I mean, do we need to convince them that violations of God's design for gender and sexuality are sinful? Not initially, I don't think. Because on one hand, they probably have plenty of other sins that they might be uh, more willing to admit initially. And then the other reality that we need to remember in Romans 2, verses 15 through 16, Paul talks about unbelieving Gentiles, and he says this, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So that idea of the law being written on people's hearts. What that means is that no matter how much people may seek to justify their or excuse their sinful behaviors, the law is still there. It's still impressed upon them. They may try to dismiss it as some arbitrary cultural standard. They might hold parades or special days to feel better about their sin but it doesn't work they can't escape the accusations of conscience no one can 
I said, we don't have to go fight some battle about that. We have to present the hope, the hope. The only hope any of us have is to be washed, is to be sanctified and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. So as we relate to people, we should reflect the hope of salvation and the love of Christ. That leads to a final landmark to guide our thinking. And it's this, it's to glorify God in your body. We've been following this idea of a piece of pottery, a cup. And a broken cup can't fulfill its purpose, right? It may, it may look good from a certain angle, Maybe a piece of it that kind of looks still together. But if you try pouring something into it, it's just going to spill everywhere. It's designed to be of service, but it can't do that until it's repaired. And that same principle applies to broken people. No one will fulfill God's purpose for their gender or sexuality until the pieces of their life are put back together in Christ and filled with the Holy Spirit. And even then, we're still imperfect this side of eternity, right? We're still a little leaky. Um, those distorted desires still pull at us, and we're still in this sinful culture that wants to shake us up. None of that helps. But we, by the power of the Spirit in us, can aspire to grow in glorifying God with our bodies. We're designed to serve. Now, Paul develops uh, the idea of Christian thinking about gender and sexuality there in 1 Corinthians 6 and 7. Picking up where we left off in verse 11, he then refutes the idea that sex is nothing more than just like a bodily function, a bodily need to be met. And, and he quotes Genesis 2, 24, to show that it's part of a one flesh relationship. And so the prostitution that was so prevalent in Corinth is, he, he says, it's wrong, as is all sexual immorality. So skipping down to verses 18 through 20, he says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You were not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. If you're a believer, your, your body, your physical body, was purchased by Christ through his death and resurrection. And the Holy Spirit dwells within you as, as if you're a temple and he exerts Christ's ownership over you. And so that means that what you do with your body matters to him. The thoughts that you think matter to him. That's the problem with pornography, right? We shouldn't, shouldn't think lustful thoughts. We should do everything we can to avoid sexual immorality, to stay away from it, to fulfill God's design. Now, apparently, the Corinthians were confused about what that meant for married life. As you move into chapter 7, verse 1, we learn that some adopted the ascetic view that the only way to be holy was to avoid uh, sex completely. And Paul rejects that idea. In verses 3 and 4 of chapter 7, he says, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. You see, here's something that I think gets lost. With our distorted desires, sex becomes all about getting, about personal satisfaction. And so people give up on marriage, claiming that their needs were not being met. But Paul describes sex here from the standpoint of serving one another. That husbands must serve their wives, think about them first, before themselves. That wives must serve their husbands. 
Right? And, and it's not even a, a meeting in the middle. It's, it's 100% service. Right? Concerned to help each other resist sexual temptation. To follow God's design. Now that same focus on service also shapes the way that husband and wife fulfill their distinctive gender roles. We won't turn there right now, but in Ephesians chapter 5, I think a familiar passage to many of us, Paul calls husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Right In the same passage, wives are called to submit to their husbands, to be respectful, But again, that kind of supportive role, yes, it can be abused. We talked about that. The culture does that. But when a man truly lives in a Christ-like way, that submission is not a burdensome thing. When he's living in loving, sacrificial service, and that, so that's part of our, how we relate, and it plays into sexuality as well. Of course, now, the difficulties arise when one person seeks to serve and their spouse doesn't. I mean, in those times, again, we have to remember marriage is not about meeting in the middle. It's about obeying and serving the Lord. And that's particularly important if one person is somehow trying to lead the other into sin. I mean, obedience to the Lord always has to be first just like we talked about with government. And Peter talks about that in 1 Peter 3. It's about a a wife with a disobedient husband. There's a a place to communicate concern, but not to nag. Peter talks about praying, trusting the Lord, and following God's design by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot more could be said about marital issues. I realize I'm just kind of not even scratching the surface there. But what about, what about believers who just feel no attraction to the opposite sex or those who are, who are tempted by same-sex attraction? Salvation doesn't take away those distorted desires. What about people who, don't, who just don't want to get married? Should they pursue biblical marriage anyway since it was God's original design? No. Paul talks about it. If we keep reading in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 6 through 9, he says, Now, as a concession, not a command, I say this I wish that all were as I myself am. But each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and widows, I say that it's good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. See, I think sometimes as as Christians, we can place so much emphasis on marriage and family that singles feel pressured. They have to get married. Or they feel excluded from fellowship. Because everybody's always talking about marriage and kids. But Paul encouraged singleness in the service of Christ. So did Jesus. Paul saw it as a gift from God. Now, some people say that means uh, an ability to be content with singleness, but I I think in the context of the chapter, I think his points that marriage and singleness are both, uh, both have their good points. Because right, further down in the chapter, he goes on to explain that the single person can be undistracted in serving the Lord. While the married person has to, uh, has to make time and think about their spouse, right? what their spouse desires, what their spouse wants. And of course, Paul acknowledges here, being single is not easy. Because according to God's design, remaining single means abstaining from sexual activity. So he says that it's, for some, it is best to pursue marriage and not stay single. But whether married or single, the goal of every believer, we come back to this, Paul said it there at the end of chapter 6, it's to glorify God in our bodies, to avoid sexual immorality. Those who are married should serve the Lord by serving one another, and singles should focus 
have that exclusive focus on serving the Lord. So as you navigate all the cultural confusion surrounding gender and sexuality, follow these four landmarks. God designed, <clears throat> excuse me, gender and sexuality. But the fall and distorts our desires. <clears throat> excuse me. Thankfully, Jesus saves sinners. And despite our brokenness, we can grow in glorifying the Lord with our bodies. So what's your response to these passages of Scripture that we've read? Like we said, we've all been stained by sin. But no matter what sinful deeds you've committed, Jesus is ready to save you. He died and rose again to wash us, to sanctify us, to justify us. And so if, I, if you've never done so, I encourage you to seek cleansing in Christ, to place your faith in him, to entrust your life to him. Because his saving grace is what makes broken lives beautiful. I think we'd all benefit from reflecting more on Paul's discussion of sexuality in 1 Corinthians 6 and 7. Because he charts a course for us that diverges both from liberal ideas and a lot of conservative ideas about gender and sexuality. Perhaps you need to refocus on glorifying God with your body. To make a commitment to focus on serving the Lord. You might also need to change how you speak about sexual sin. Now, you might be, on one hand, maybe too accepting, too affirming even of what the Bible says is sinful. Or you might be so angry and condescending about it that you fail to communicate the saving power and the hope of the gospel. And so we come back to what the series is all about. May we speak the truth in love. Let's pray. Father, we, um, we pray for wisdom, for insight, and understanding, Lord. That we would know your word, that we would live it out. Lord, in our uh, in how we conduct our bodies, how we live, but also in how we relate to people, in the way that we speak and act. We pray that you'd help us to grow in Christ's likeness. And Father, we thank you for the incredible blessing of salvation, that we can be forgiven and reconciled to you. Lord, we praise you today for your saving grace. In Jesus' name.